chance to address everyone here today. As James said, I'm Cindy Mitchell, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Logscape, and we do big data analytics for system monitoring and root cause analysis. So for companies that have hundreds or thousands of servers that are all generating lots and lots of data to log files and system <coughs> registries and structured data as well, we provide um, a tool that helps you to analyze all that data and visualize and do pattern-based matching and understand what's going on. But I'm not going to talk about Logscape today. Um, I'm actually, um, in addition to being the co-founder and CEO of Logscape, I'm also a senior advisor at ThoughtWorks, where I have worked for the last 10 years, first as a developer, and then moved into more management type roles. I've been in our UK operation for a few years and then spent about five years founding and growing our product business called Power Studios, which does tools for agile software projects, so project management tools, um, release management, testing, mingle, twist and go, if some of you have come across those products. So, um, so I've spent a lot of time kind of working um, in the out the industry with ThoughtWorks clients. I spent a lot of time with executives of software organizations, business executives who have turned into software executives because their software has become so dependent on, on um, uh, because their business has become so dependent on software. So, um, so I'm going to spend a, time, a little time today just sharing with you some thoughts that I've kind of collected around how do you scale craft, how do you take it to an organizational level so you can really have strategic impact with software in your organization. So in addition to being a software executive, um, I was, I'm also uh, from the last generation of a long line of hog farmers, and I grew up in a place called Nebraska. The color isn't uh, coming out on this map, or, but uh, on this picture, but Nebraska is this one here. Has, has anyone been to Nebraska in the room? Oh wow, quite a few people. So you all know it's a lovely place, um, filled with lovely people, very flat and very agricultural. And I grew up on a hog farm. Um, and for anyone who knows anything about hog farming, who knows anything about hog farming? <laughs> Slightly fewer people, but a brother here in the front row. Um, and so anyone who knows anything about hog farming, um, you're basically constantly walking this line between going out of business and producing a quality product. And, um, and so you have to know a lot about how to scale your craft and scale what it is that you're doing. And some of the things that um, have been carried forward, so my family came from Denmark, they were hog farmers in Denmark, and my grandfather's grandfather, and um, so we kind of brought the tradition forward um, into our farm in Nebraska. And so you kind of have to really have a good understanding of how to scale your craft, how do you scale the craft of hog farming, what are the key levers or dimensions that you have to work with to grow and still produce a quality product. And so one of the, one of the key levers is, of course, the quality of food. So where I live is covered in stuff that looks like this. Who knows what this is? <laughs> okay. um, and it's covered in stuff that looks like this, and this is the stuff that hogs love. And so you grind up this corn and you feed it to them. Hogs also love this stuff. There's less of it where I live, but there's a lot in the neighboring states, um, below, uh, below Nebraska. And so the quality of the food um, and the ratio in which you grind this food, the corn and the oats together, and, and in some cases, if, if in years where corn is very expensive, you add in some soy, and this again affects the quality of the, of the meat and the product that you produce. In addition to food, um, another key lever that you have to deal with is water. And the quality of the water and also the plentifulness of the supply of water is actually a very key factor in raising good livestock, period, but specifically hogs. And this was actually part of our kind of secret sauce for my family farm. We lived, our property was on some very iron-rich well water, and so we pumped all this water up. So our property is covered in things that look like this. Does anyone know what this is? This is a hydrant. <laughs> um, um, and uh, it comes, these are a special kind of hydrant, actually, which is made in um, the state next to mine, which is called Iowa. But it, and it basically pumps the water in a specific way. So it's a very iron-rich source of water, which contributes to the quality of the meat. And so in years, for example, the winter, and the pipes are frozen up, we have to find, and we can't get the well water out, we have to use water from another source. We have to think about how to offset the, um, the fact that there will be a lack of iron going into our livestock and into, into the flow of the, of the, of the herd. So we have food, we have water. Um, another key thing we have is just the environment that the hogs are raised in. And so everybody knows, I'm sure, that open, free-range um, animals is the best way. They, they're more relaxed, they're more chilled out. They get to you know, get, get around and get some exercise. Um, 
lots of shade, so we would, if in the case that um, they were not in a shady property, we would cover the, the property with some artificial shade. Um, lots of water and misting, so they get very, very hot in the summertime, and so you need to cool them down. In the wintertime, when you have any litters of pigs, they have to be warm, and so you create you know, a heat, um, heat lamp and a heated environment for the pigs. But it's an important factor, so when hogs are stressed out, they're, they don't produce good quality meat, and so you need to make sure that they're relaxed and enjoying their life um, on the farm. So, so we have food, water, environment, all very key levers to, to producing quality um, product. We also have um, the breeds of the hogs, so does anyone know these breeds? No? So, <laughs> upper left is a Hampshire, so Hampshires are um, known for their temperament, they're kind of really chilled out, so hogs can be quite aggressive, and this particular breed is, is very relaxed, so um, they're not going to give you too much trouble. The one on the upper right is a Yorkshire breed, and they're known for their mothering skills, so they usually have very large litters, and, um, and they're good moms. And then the bottom is, is the Duroc, and the Duroc is uh, very lean meat, so if you put these, these are the three breeds that we cross bred together. And it ended up producing quite a quality product, and we, we were crossbreeding over many, many years, and so the product just continues to improve. So the diversity um, of, of the stock actually makes a huge difference to the quality of the meat, uh, particularly as you scale. And then the other key, another key lever, is the size of the herd. So uh, these are sows, and they produce these little things called piglets. And, um, um, and we had, so at any given time, your herd is maybe, if for our operation, we only went to 10, so that, that was the, the maximum that we could manage. Um, and so we would have several herds of 10, and they'd be fair away at different times. And so the reason why you do that is because, again, it's about for creating a relaxed environment. If you could imagine a maternity ward of 10 mothers, and each mother producing 12 babies, and they're all being there in the maternity ward at the same time. It's a pretty, um, you know, rocket situation. And so you try to keep the herd small. One, because it's less stressful for the sows, particularly at the time of birth, but also because um, you can keep a really close eye on them. So you can really get to know your hogs very well. You can, um, as individuals, understand and see each one of them. You can see any changes that are happening. You can monitor them very carefully. So if there's an illness or some kind of irregularity that starts to develop, you can actually address it. And so there's this really intense kind of personal attention. And the smaller the herds, um, the, the more likelihood that you'll have of being able to watch all the changes and, and catch anything that's um, a bit worrying as it arises. So you have the food, you have the water, you have the environment, you have the crossbreeding, and you have the, um, the size of the herd. And the last thing really is about um, the humans that are around it. And so to, to have a hog farm of, of any sort of scale, and, and you know, we weren't the largest intentionally because we wanted to control our quality, you have to have a herd of people to actually run and manage that hog farm. And so we have very large families where I come from and in my family, so this is my immediate family, there were eight of us. And um, hog farming is an intensely human, I mean, to do it well at scale, um, it's intentionally, intensely human activities. You're up at four in the morning and you're out feeding and you're keeping a close eye on everything, you're making sure the water supply is right, paying attention to the food. Um, and you have to understand also the interrelations of all of these different dimensions of quality, all of these levers that you have to play with. So in a year where corn is very expensive, for example, you have to substitute with soy, you have to think about well, what impact does that have and how I'm going to offset it somewhere else. And these are just a few of the examples. So everyone in the system really has to understand quality. They have to understand what the levers are and how they impact each other. Um, and, and it ends up becoming just an intensely human and social and collaborative activity because any one family can't manage their own farm on their own. And so at any time we're you know, moving sounds around, there's, there's different stages of the farrowing life cycle and your whole family kind of comes over and everyone's a part of that. And so it's, it's really quite a, a fun and, and joyous um, environment to be a part of. Um, and it's in, intensely human. <coughs> and so these are the kind of important factors that you have to, to play with. Mm. So fast forward more years than I care to admit. Um, and <laughs> I've um, now been working in the software industry for over 17 years um, as, a, as an executive for ThoughtWorks in the last 10 years or so. And um, for those who don't know much about ThoughtWorks, it's a 2,300 person organization. So it's, it's grown, it's 20 years old now. And it's more than doubled in the time that I've been with the organization. 
And ThoughtWorks has a, a pretty, so ThoughtWorks works with people and organizations that have quite ambitious missions and need sort of a disruptive approach to, to bring software to make their, their missions come to life. And um, ThoughtWorks itself has, so it does massive, large scale software projects from you know, five or ten people, but up to hundreds, and it just depending upon what the, the customer situation is it requires. But ThoughtWorks itself has quite an ambitious mission. So ThoughtWorks' mission is to better humanity through software and drive the creation of a more socially and economically just world. And so it's, you know, kind of kind of a big hundred year type thing, not something you're going to do in, in a couple of years time frame. Um, and so, you know, when you set out a mission like that uh, for an organization, it's, you know, can be quite motivating and quite exciting for people. Uh, but what you soon find is that you have to give a lot more context underneath that. Everyone doesn't know immediately, okay, our mission is to better humanity through software, I know what to get up and do today when I go to work. And so, what we found is, of course, that we needed to break that down into two more levels. And so, we have what we call three, the three pillars of our organization around which we operate. Um, and the first of these pillars is what we call just running a sustainable business. And so ThoughtWorks isn't a, it's a for-profit company, but it's not profit-driven in what it does. Um, and so we like to say, our, our chief scientist, Martin Fowler, we likes to say, we need to have enough oxygen to be able to do the things that, that we want to do um, with, our, with our lives and with our time. So we don't really talk about profit, we talk about oxygen and generating enough. So running a sustainable business is about generating enough oxygen to do the things we want to do. So that's our first pillar, it's just about being smart and, and, and doing a good job at the fundamentals of running a business. The second pillar is um, championing software excellence. And so this is about you know, being a part of a greater ecosystem that's really trying to advance the practice and the state of the art of software development. And the third pillar is advocating for social and economic justice. So, um, and this isn't just, you know, typical, like we give 10% of our profits to this thing or that thing. It's a, using our hearts and our minds and the time that we have now and the skills that we have available to us now as an organization, using those skills to um, advance social and economic justice. So, um, and this isn't just, you know, typical, like we give 10% of our profits to this thing or that thing. It's a, using our hearts and our minds and the time that we have now and the skills that we have available to us now as an organization, using those skills to um, advance social and economic justice. So this could be working with rural farmers in India and helping them produce better solutions for managing their crops. It could be working in rural healthcare um, in, in Africa and producing better solutions that allow doctors and patients to interact with each other. It could be through building grassroots and community um, organizations and sites that help people like Democracy Now! or Get Up or some of the kind of grassroots community organizations do their work better. So it's a whole variety of different things, um, but it's about using our time and our skills and our hearts now to do those things as opposed to waiting until we've had a grand um, exit strategy and have a lot of cash on hand to do something with it. So we have this big mission and we have these pillars underneath it and that starts to give you a little bit more context. Okay, I can see what better in humanity through software might be or how to apply myself to that. But then, you know, underneath that there's still more details. It's okay, advocating for social and economic justice, but which causes, which people, who do we focus on? Is it, you know, people in the West, if it's people in the, in the global South, but how do we apply this? Um, and in the case of just championing software excellence specifically, which is what I, what I want to go into a little bit more deeply in the time that I have left, um, there became this like, what does it mean to champion software excellence? What is, what is software excellence? What is excellent software? Um, and I think you know the, the craftsmanship movement has certainly give us, given us a lot of information about what you know good software craft looks like and what software craftsmanship is. Um, but um, but what does it mean to have excellent software um, you know at scale for an organization? And so because of software excellence, we set up a software excellence board and <laughs> studied this issue very carefully. I was led by our, our brilliant CTO Rebecca Parsons, and we spent a lot of time just thinking about what are the what are the dimensions of excellent software? What do they actually look like? And so we, um, we came up with something that looks like this. Um, and you know, I guess the, the first thing to observe is that software is not down, excellent software is not down one dimension, it's a, it's a multi-dimensional thing. Um, and you know, we saw these six dimensions. Uh, the first of which is the business value. So any software that's that's excellent, that's worth its um, worth its uh, what's been put into it, has to be 
get some utility for the business. So there needs to be a use for the software and it needs to deliver value to the business or the organization that's actually commissioned the software. So pretty basic one, but it needs to be useful. It has to be, there needs to be some utility to the organization. Similarly, there can be software um, that has quite a lot of utility to the organization but that the customers actually don't want. So there has to be some utility of the software to the customer or to the imagined end user of the software. And then next to that, and somewhat related but not the same, is there has to be a, a delightful user experience. People have to want to use the software. It has to make them feel good. It has to fit into their lives, the way that they think, the way they work. Um, and the way that they operate. So there needs to be um, a, a good user experience. Um, on the bottom here, delivery effectiveness. So looking at, and, and we see this a lot, and those of you who work in organizations who do large scale software development, um, there's a lot of, just tremendous amount of waste that goes into to building enterprise software. And so thinking about the appropriateness of the resources that are actually expended to deliver software is actually a key part of, of thinking about creating excellent software. So how efficient is the delivery process? You know, is it a, an appropriate ex expenditure of human life and resources to actually create that software? And sadly, in many organizations, the answer to that is quite often no, in, in my experience. On the technical excellence dimension, so this is what I think a lot of people think of as software craft. And I think there's, there's two ways to look at technical excellence, but we look at technical excellence. One is the external quality of the software you create. So is it functionally, it doesn't do what it's meant to be doing? Um, is it reliable? Is it up and running when people are calling on it and, and attempting to use it? So there's this external quality, but then there's also, of course, the internal quality, which is um, you know, the structure of the code, uh, the, the ability to maintain it, the toxicity levels, those sorts of things. So there's, there's that, that covered under technical excellence is the kind of broader external and notions of internal and external quality. Operational effectiveness, so I think this is the, you know, obviously the key place that the whole DevOps movement is getting at. So how easy is this software to monitor and manage in its, and, and, and work through its life cycle? I think these days the life cycle of software is, you know, much more volatile. We're really pushing changes on a, an hourly, daily, weekly type basis as opposed to, you know, a big um, chunky delivery. And so is this software easy to change, easy to manage, easy to monitor, is it easy to understand what's going on? Um, and so these are the six dimensions that we kind of think about when we think about creating excellent software for our clients. And I think it's, you know, it's obvious this is a spider chart, so there's, you know, dimensions, or there's, there's, you know, ticks along each one of these dimensions, and, you know, there, there's probably a minimum level for each one of these for software to be truly called excellent, but it's going to depend on your circumstances, your, you know, what, what it is that you're trying to create, how excellent you want to be on any one of these dimensions. And of course, they impact each other greatly. So, um, you know, the technical license of the software is going to affect the ability to actually get it live quickly and, and regularly, and make frequent updates and releases. Um, and it's going to dramatically that's going to dramatically affect the business value and so forth. So everything is kind of intertwined. And of course, um, I shall I think did quite a, a great justice to the culture and the structure and the practices of any organization is what constrains these things. So. You can be a five if you've got great culture and practice and structure, and you're probably going to be a zero or you know somewhere in the lower ranks if you're if you've not figured out as an organization how to how to create good software culture. Um, and I think probably the key um, the key thing, and I think Shelley did good justice to some of this, so I'll flip it through it quickly. But um, the, the key thing that I think in, in helping an organization get to grips with these dimensions of software excellence and how do they actually put them um, in, into play in their own organization is quality. And so building an organizational understanding of what quality is and how every individual in the system, um, just like on my hog farm actually, if how every decision and every individual affects quality um, is a key part to any organization scaling craft and building good software. A lot of organizations when they tend to, to build, um, you know, to scale their programs or their projects or their software organizations end up with code bases that look um, not unlike this. And a lot of times people think, oh, it's, this is the developer's fault. Developers create crappy code. They're not skilled or, you know, they're not, they don't care. Um, and people do get caught up. I see this all the time, as Shannon mentioned, in this whole kind of features versus quality dilemma. So it's like everyone, because the people in the decision, the people in the position to make decisions about features can't see quality. They can't see the crap that's getting created underneath. They, they, they make bad decisions all the time. So they make decisions for features 
over quality all the time because they don't understand what's happening underneath it. And so it's my job to, to explain to the senior executives of the organization, to the CEO, to the, the you know, head of digital, to the product manager, to explain to them how their behavior and their, um, their decisions and the organization that they built um, and creates this and, and, and not developers. And this is what I typically use to, to describe technical debt um, to a senior leader and executive in a software organization. Have you, anyone seen this before? So this is yeah, this is the um, it's, a, it's a cost of change curve basically, and so and executives can typically get this. Um, so in the ideal world, who was the person who made me fun of managers? So they, they can get this. Um, the um, um, so in the ideal world, when we build software, we we, end, we stay on this bottom line. So we add a few features, something small, we release, we clean up the mess we made, we, we get anything that we branched and, and didn't merge, we actually go back and merge it, the test we commented out, we fix, um, the stuff code we copy from the here, here to there, we go back and, and, and you know, we factor it and make it look good. So in an ideal world, we make all these changes and we do it in a very clean way, we clean up after ourselves, um, and we stay down here, and that means the cost of changes is quite low, it's quite easy to change our software. But in the real world, what happens, um, at least in many large enterprises that, that I work in, is people end up on this curve. So they make a change, they make a little mess, they don't clean it up, and then, you know, th because someone's saying features, 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 they quickly add some more features, and, and they add a little bit more debt, and they quickly add some more features, they add more. And effectively what you do is, is you end up on this line where it becomes really, really difficult to introduce change into your code base. Uh, it becomes difficult to estimate how long it will take to make those changes and to actually make those changes. And so, of course, what happens at an organizational level is that your responsiveness to customers and to new requests goes down. Your delivery speed goes down. You're unable to do things quickly because you've created this big pile of, of, of technical debt um, that is, is barring you from, from moving forward. And so, what I try to explain, well, obviously there's many, many details over this in terms of explaining why these kind of things happen. Part of it is people getting comfortable with this short-term pain of taking on good software engineering practice. People want, you know, immediately everyone to know how to do TDD and how to, what continuous integration is and pairing and refactoring and understand, you know, good software craftsmanship. But this is something that has to be learned and, and you know, being able to take the, the short-term pain over the long-term gain is a key mindset that um, a lot of executive leaders need to develop. The other thing, I think this isn't that hard to understand, but it was the thing that really made, killed, nearly killed the agile movement in the early days. Everyone said, hey, let's go agile. And they started you know, organizing on the work of increments and having stand-ups. They took on all the collaboration practices of agile. And um, I'm going to be caned off. Yeah. Um, and, and they took on the organizational practices of agile, but they didn't, um, they didn't take on the technical practices. And the reality is understanding how, well, again, all these things fit together. So it's one thing to have stand-ups and, 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 and organize your work in backlogs and work in short increments. It's another thing to build the feedback loops of good engineering into your code base. So things like TDD and, and continuous integration, these are feedback loops that help us understand where we are and how we're going. And they need to be understood at an organizational level. This is the reason to do quality. So I don't know if anyone's seen this. It's the Agile Triangle. I shall um, roughly finish on this note. But this is the reason, it's, it's not, the point is not just to do quality for the sake of quality, it's actually to be able to create beautiful things for our end users. And so this is Jim Heisman's Agile Triangle, if you haven't read his Agile Project Management book. Um, he's also a thought worker. On the bottom, many people who are um, familiar with the old school Iron Triangle of product management, or project management, there's this cost, schedule, scope, sort of, you know, um, you'll have a successful project if you kind of fit within these boundaries. And it's obviously, you know, it's very obvious sitting here in 2013 that cost, schedule, and show, scope are not goals of a software project. They're ridiculous things to be thinking about as we set up a project. They're not, that doesn't, if, if, we, if we fit in the triangle, it doesn't mean we've achieved anything. And, you know, I think if you look at any of the IEEE reports or anything like that, there's, there's so much software that gets created in this world that's never used or rarely used. And so scope is a really crappy project control mechanism and you should get rid of it entirely and in your organization build instead um, a, a culture which actually is centered around value and asking yourself, can we release this now? So orienting everything you do, all of your decision making around value and the ability to get the value into the hands of the end user and understand if it is indeed valuable to them is a key um, part of creating excellent software. And that's what quality allows us to do. It allows us to work quickly and, and adapt and respond quickly. I shall finish now. Everyone knows we've talked a lot about humans and culture. So software is still a fundamentally human, social, and collaborative activity. And any organization
generation that doesn't get this can forget it, as far as I'm concerned, um, around creating excellent software. So organi uh, organizational understanding of quality and the dimensions and the factors that are at play, putting humans at the center, human-centered organizations, great bacon and great software. Okay.